Freak. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. It's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. And today we have a doozy, a sad to say, a long lecture, but it is very important because kind of what is going on at this time period in Europe and most likely, obviously, worldwide is this idea of nationalism. And so we're going to start off. This is a new unit. Okay. So new unit, new chapters, although they're the same chapters, but, you know, new topics of nationalism and imperialism. We combine them into two. And that's why this is a long lecture slash unit. But I'm here to make it uh, interesting for you. So let's let's get into the mix. Remember, this idea of nationalism is kind of what broke up Napoleon's empire. Pride for one's country, love for your country. Nationalism. Okay, so this is a two title note day unit. Four, we start a new unit, nationalism and imperialism. Here's again, we're back in chapter five for the third unit in a row. But I feel that uh, a, a lot of things are going on. Obviously, we got industrialization and nationalism. Remember, you got to think in the back of your head, huh, this is... The Industrial Revolution is still going on. You have to think of that because a lot of these problems stem from that. And people are like, no, let's keep things in our country. We all speak the same language. We have the same culture. We have the same religion. Let's form our own country. So chapter five. Uh, and today we're talking about nationalism, unification, and reform. But that last little bit, save for us. Okay. Um, that was your warm-up. Objectives. We're going to describe how the Crimean War destroyed the concert of Europe. And explain how political stability led to a more liberal Great Britain. If you recall, the concert of Europe, after the fall of Napoleon was set up to regularly meet and intervene on the side of the absolute ruler and restore monarchies across Europe. So the Crimean War is going to destroy that. Spoiler alert. All right, Europe, what's next? So... The revolutions of 1848 had failed, but by 1871, both Germany and Italy were ready to be unified, and nation states were rapidly becoming the most common form of political organization. The Ottoman Empire had long controlled the Balkan region in southeastern Europe, and in 1800, the OE, Ottoman Empire, was in decline, and Russia was interested in expanding its power into Ottoman lands in the Balkans. This expansion would allow Russian ships to sail through the Dardanelles, the straits between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. If Russia could achieve this goal, it would be the major power in Eastern Europe and challenge Britain's naval control of the Eastern Mediterranean. Other European nations feared Russian ambition and had their own interests in the decline of the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottomans, uh, which is modern day Turkey, by the way, but the Ottoman Empire, remember, is the former Byzantine Empire, which is the former East, is it Eastern Roman Empire? Remember that? Do you remember that? Was it called Eastern or was it called Byzantine? Well, there you go. That's that's your that's your fun fact for the day. Uh, this is the Ottoman Empire at the time, and this area. Let's see if I can. This area right here, that's the Balkan region. That's where stuff is going to take off. BT Dubs 
if you look at Germany, look at all these different colors in Germany, all those different kingdoms. All right. So this is Germany, Ottoman Empire. Italy, look, Italy's different. Okay, the Dardanelles is this land right here through the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And up above here, where my arrow is, that's Russia. All right, the Crimean War. So, in 1853, the Russians invaded the Turkish Balkan provinces of Moldavia and Wallachia. Wallachia. In response, the Ottoman Turks declared war on Russia. Great Britain and France, fearful of Russian gains in this war, declared war on Russia the following year, and this conflict came to be known as the Crimean War. And the Crimean War was poorly planned and poorly fought. Eventually, heavy losses caused the Russians to seek peace, and with the Treaty of Paris signed in 1856, Russia agreed to allow Moldavia and Wallachia to be placed under the protection of all the great powers. The effect of the Crimean War was to destroy the concert of Europe. Austria and Russia, the chief powers in maintaining the status quo before the 1850s, were now enemies. Austria had its own interest in the Balkans and refused to support Russia in the Crimean War. A defeated and humiliated Russia withdrew from European affairs for the next 20 years. And now Austria was without friends among the great powers. And this situation opened the door to unification of Italy and Germany. And that's where we're going to skr and talk about mostly today. So this is Moldavia or modern day Moldova right here. And then this is Wallachia and then Transylvania. That's an actual place, yes. And uh, it's all a part of Romania nowadays. So this is where they invaded. Crimea is the peninsula right here. Okay, in Moldavia, Wallachia. And then the Allies come through here and fight at Sevastopol and Balaklava. Balaklava, I think. All right, Italians unify. So, in 1850, Austria was still the dominant power on the Italian peninsula. After the failures of the revolutions of 1848, Italian nationalists began to look to the northern Italian state of Piedmont for leadership in achieving unification of Italy. The royal house of Savoy ruled the kingdom of Piedmont, which include, included the island of Sardinia and the small regions of the northwest Italy known as Piedmont, Nice, and Savoy. The ruler of the kingdom, beginning in 1849, was King Victor Emmanuel II. The king named Camilo de Cavour his prime minister in 1852, and as prime minister, Cavour pursued a policy of economic growth in order to equip a large army. Cavour knew that Piedmont's army was not strong enough to defeat the Austrians, so he made an alliance with the French emperor, Louis Napoleon, and provoked the Austrians into declaring war in 1859. Following the conflict, a settlement gave Nice and Savoy to the French, Lombardy was given to Piedmont and, Aust and Aust from Austria, and Venetia remained under control of Austria. Cavour's success caused nationalists in other states like Parma, Modena, and Tuscany to overthrow their governments and to join their states to Piedmont. So while that's happening in the north, BT dubs, this is Lombardy and Venetia under control of Austria. This is Piedmont, Sardinia, okay? And then um, Lombardy was given after this little war, the Frank, is it the Franco-Austrian War? Austro-Frank War? I don't know. Um, and Piedmont got... Some of them, some of them. Ooh. Okay, that's uh, Victor Emmanuel II. That's Camilo de Cavour. That's Louis Napoleon. Look at, look, they all have the same facial hair. I guess that was a style. Style. All right. 
Meanwhile, in southern Italy, a new Italian leader had arisen, his name Giuseppe Garibaldi, a dedicated patriot who raised an army of a thousand volunteers called Red Shirts. A branch of the Bourbon dynasty ruled the two Sicilies, Sicily and Naples, and a revolt broke out in Sicily against the king. Garibaldi's forces landed in Sicily and by the end of July 1860 controlled most of the island. That's Sicily's the island of the boot. In August, Garibaldi's forces crossed over to mainland and began a victorious march up the Italian peninsula. The entire kingdom of the two Sicilies fell in early September. Garibaldi made the conscious decision to turn over his conquests to Piedmont. And by March 17th, 1861, the new state of Italy was proclaimed under King Victor Emmanuel II. However, the task of unification wasn't complete since Austria still held control over Venetia and Rome was under the control of the Pope-supported French troops. Italians will gain control over Venetia as a result of supporting Prussia in a war between Austria and Prussia. In 1870, the Franco-Prussian War, the French troops... After the, after the war, the French troops will withdraw from Rome. This withdrawal will lead to the Italian army to annex Rome in September 1870, and Rome became Italy's new capital. So it, it took some time, okay? It took some time, about nine more years, until these, uh, oh, we got to go back here, until these papal states in Rome were under control. So basically, think of pink green and blue under control of new italy and then these papal states nine years later get taken tuscany modena romagna there you go all right unification complete i already said this <laughs> that's giuseppe garibaldi wearing guess what a red shirt so again more more fighting, more fighting. All right. Hmm. Bother the cards, I say. Anyways, this is this is the king. This is the pope. Italy. They're playing the game of cards. Again, this is how it looked. And there you go. All right. Let's uh, skr skr to Germany. Blood and iron. So after the Frankfurt Assembly achieved uh, uh, failed to achieve German unification in 1848-1849, Germans looked to Prussia for leadership in the cause of German unification. In the course of the 19th century, Prussia had become a strong, prosperous, and authoritarian state, while the Prussian king had firm control over the government and army. Prussia was known for its militarism, which is the reliance on military strength. In the 1860s, King William I tried to enlarge the Prussian army. However, when the Prussian legislature refused to levy new taxes for these proposed changes, William I appointed a new prime minister, Count Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck had often been seen as the foremost 19th century practitioner of real politique, the politics of reality. In other words, it's the politics based on practical matters rather than ethics, not in getting involved in, you know, like enlightenment ideals, you know. Bismarck openly voiced his strong dislike for anyone who opposed him. After his appointment, Big Bismarck ignored the legislative opposition to the military reforms as he proceeded to collect taxes and strengthen the army regardless of what the legislature was going to do. And from 1862 to 1866, Bismarck governed Prussia without the approval of the parliament and followed an active foreign policy, which soon led to war or wars. So again, this is Germany, 1815, the fall of, what do you want to call it? The fall of Napoleon. All right, and Prussia spans two lands over here in Western Germany and over here in Eastern Germany. It's like, where are they? They're everywhere. Okay, that's King Wilhelm William the First. 
And that's our boy, Otto von Bismarck. All right, Iron Chancellor moves. After defeating Denmark with the help of R Austria in 1864, uh, I believe it's called the Second Schleswig War, Prussia gained, oh, gained over the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein. Bismarck will then goad the Austrians, who they had help with two years before, into war against Prussia, 1866, and it's called the Austro-Prussian War. The Austrians were no match for the well-disciplined Prussian army, and they were defeated less than a month later. Prussia now organized the German states north of the main river into the North German Confederation, and the southern German states, which were largely Catholic, feared Protestant Prussia. But they also feared their Western enemy, France, so they agreed to sign these military alliances with Prussia for protection against France. Prussia now dominated all of northern Germany, and the growing power and military might of Prussia worried France. In 1870, Prussia and France became embroiled in a dispute over the candidacy of a relative of the Prussian king for the throne of Spain. Taking advantage of this situation, Bismarck pushed the French into declaring war on Prussia, July 19th, 1870. It's called the Franco-Prussian War. Prussian armies advanced into France. September 2nd, entire French army, including the French ruler, Napoleon III, was captured. Paris finally surrendered January 28th, 1871. An official peace treaty was signed in May. France had to pay 5 billion francs, which is modern-day $1 billion, and had to give up the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine to the new German state. And the loss of those territories left the French burning for revenge. So this is Holstein, this is Schleswig, and this is Prussia. And then... Now you have these other Prussia territory and what they annexed. I don't know why I'm making noises to where I'm pointing. You can't really see. And this is the Franco Aust or the Frank uh, the Austro Prussian War or Seven Weeks War campaign. And this is France and Germany at the beginning of their, their battles. Alsace and Lorraine is this little area right here that will be given up. So that again, William and Bismarck, Franco-Austrian War. Achievement unlocked. Unity! Uh, even before the war with France had ended, the southern German states agreed to enter the northern German Confederation. In January, 20, January 18th, 1871, Bismarck and 600 princes, nobles, and generals filled the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles, 12, mi 12 miles outside of Paris. William I of Prussia was proclaimed Kaiser, or Emperor, of the Second German Empire, which the which um, it's called the Second because the First was the, medi the medieval Holy Roman Empire. The Prussian ar monarchy and the Prussian army had achieved German unity. The authoritarian and militaristic values of Prussia were triumphant in this new German state with its industrial resources and military might. Germany became the strongest power in Europe. So, you know, achievement unlocked, Xbox. Um, unity. All right, so let's go over to Britain. While Italy and Germany were being unified, other states in Europe, such as Great Britain, France, Austrian Empire, Russian Empire, experienced many changes. Great Britain had managed to avoid the revolutionary upheavals in the, fir in the first half of the 19th century. In 1815, the aristocratic landowning classes dominated both houses of parliament, governed Britain. In 1832, parliament passed the bill that increased the number of male voters, which were chiefly members of the industrial middle class. Remember, industrial revolution. By giving the industrial middle class a direct interest in the process of ruling government, Britain avoided revolution in 1848 and in the 1850s and 60s. Parliament also made social and political reforms that received relieved some internal stresses and helped the country remain stable. Another reason for Britain's stability was the continuing economic growth and trade had brought prosperity to the British middle class. In the 1850s, real wages of many workers increased significantly. One key reform in Great Britain was the slavery abolition of 1833, which abolished slavery in most parts of the British Empire. Though this was inspired by the works of many 
in Great Britain's abolition movement. In many ways, it was a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Machine, pr machines produce goods more efficiently than humans, making slavery unprofitable. However, the British still depended heavily on trade with states that continued to engage in slavery, such as the United States. Queen Victoria, whose reign from 1837 to 1901 was the longest in English history, reflected perfectly the national pride of the British. Her sense of duty and moral respectability came from the values and attitudes of her age, which was later called the Victorian Age. Victorian England. There you have a sign. Again, this is the British Empire. I know it's very pixelated, but this is the British Empire around this time, Victorian age. It's Queen Victoria painting. All right, return of the monarchy. So in France, events after the revolution of 1848 moved toward the restoration of the monarchy. Four years after his election as president in 1848, Louis Napoleon returned to the people to ask for the restoration of the empire. In this plebiscite or popular vote, 97% responded with a yes. December 2nd, 1852, Louis Napoleon assumed the title of Emperor Napoleon III, and the Second Empire had begun. Remember, Louis Napoleon was the nephew of Napoleon I. Remember, Napoleon II was Napoleon's actual son, but remember, he never ruled France. The government of Napoleon III was clearly authoritarian. As chief of state, Napoleon III controlled the armed forces, police, and civil service. Only he could introduce legislation and declare war. The legislative corps gave an appearance of representative government because the members of the group were elected by universal male suffrage for six-year terms, but they could never initiate legislation nor affect the budget. Napoleon III controlled, completely controlled the government and limited civil liberties, and to distract the public from their loss of political freedom, he focused on expanding the economy. Government subsidies helped foster the rapid construction of railroads, harbors, roads, and canals. In the midst of this economic expansion, Napoleon III carried out vast rebuilding of the city of Paris in the 1860s. Opposition to some of Napoleon's economic and governmental policies arose. In response, Napoleon began to liberalize his regime, giving the legislative more power. However, after the French were defeated in the Franco-Prussian War, the Second Empire fell. Again, Napoleon III, we've seen him before. And here's Napoleon after being captured by your boy, Otto von Bismarck. He looks happy. All right, dual monarchy. So nationalism was a major force in the 19th century, but Europe's most powerful states, the Austrian Empire, was a multinational empire that had been able to frustrate the desire of its ethnic groups for independence. After the Habsburg rulers crushed the revolutions of 1848-1849, they restored centralized autocratic government to the empire. Austria's defeat at the hands of the Prussians in 1866, however, forced the Austrians to make concessions to the fiercely nationalistic Hungarians. The result was called the Compromise of 1867, which created the dual monarchy of Austria-Hungary. Each of these two components of the empire now had its own constitution, legislature, government, and bureau government, bureaucracy, and capital. Vienna for Austria, Budapest for Hungary. Holding the two states together was a single monarch, Francis Joseph, Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary, and a common army, foreign policy, and a system of finances. So again, this is this is the Austrian Empire. And you can't make out these names, but Germans live in Austria, Hungarians in Hungary. You have the Czechs in blue, which doesn't show up. I don't know why. Oh, checks in blue right here. Okay, you got the Slovaks right here. You got the Poles in purple. You got the... I don't know what that word is. You got the Slovenes in this right here. I have no idea what that... Is that Croats and Serbs? And then you have Romanians and... Maybe that's Italians because that's Italy right there. So a lot of people in this Habsburg Empire. That's Francis Joseph. Again, the mustache. Love it. Okay, so from Russia with love. At the beginning of the 19th century, Russia was still rural, agricultural, and autocratic. The Russian czar was regarded as a divine right monarch with unlimited power. In 1856, the Russians suffered the humiliating defeat in the Crimean War. 
even conservatives realized Russia was falling behind in West from yes, Western European states. So Tsar Alexander II decided to make reforms. Serfdom, you know, like slavery, was the largest problem in Tsarist Russia. On March 3rd, 1861, Alexander issued an emancipation edict which freed the serfs, which meant peasants can now own property and the government provided land for the peasants by buying it from the landlords. Sounds great. But this new land system was not very helpful to the peasants. Landowners kept the best lands for themselves, and the newly freed peasants had little, little good land to support themselves. Emancipation then led to a not free landowning peasantry, but to an unhappy, land starved peasantry that followed the old ways of farming. Alexander II attempted to further reforms meant to help Russia catch up to the more industrialized nations of Europe. Russia's well, railway system was improved. Government sponsored some industrialized programs and foreign investors provided funds for their industry. Although it did not catch them up with many other European powers, by 1900, Russia still had made a great leap in industrialization. However, in the end, Alexander's reforms pleased no one. Reformers wanted more changes, but conservatives thought the czar was destroying their basic institutions. So when radicals assassinated Alexander II in 1881, his son, Alexander III, turned against most of these social reform programs. I mean, you kill his father, he's only going to act in repress repressive moods. So here's some serfs. That was a picture of serfs. More serfs. That's Alexander II. This is the assassination of it. Of him, and that's his son, looking all crazy. I know this is like a portrait or drawing animation, but, you know, you get what it... All right, uh, last slide. Uh, America has issues, too. Is we're not, we're not a perfect country. The U.S. Constitution committed to the nation, liberalism and nationalism, yet the unity didn't come easily by the mid-19th century. That's 1850. Disagreements about slavery threatened to tear the U.S. apart. This should sound familiar. The South's economy was based on growing cotton on plantations, chiefly done by slave labor. Four million enslaved African Americans lived in the South by 1860 compared to one million by 1800. The South was determined to maintain the cotton economy and plantation-based slavery. Abolitionism, a movement to end slavery, rose up in the North and directly challenged the Southern way of life. As opinions over slavery grew more divided, compromise became less and less possible. Future President Abraham Lincoln said in a speech in 1858 that the government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. When Lincoln was elected president in eight, November 1860, war became certain. In April 1861, fighting erupted between the North and the South. And as we all know, the American Civil War fought for four years. 1861 to 1865 was a bloody struggle. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation declared most of the nation's enslaved people forever free. The Confederate forces surrendered you know, April 9th, 1865, and the U.S. remained united, one nation, indivisible. So here's some uh, slavery pictures. There's Abraham Lincoln. And here's the Civil War map. Remember, uh, it was the orange as the Confederacy. And then the like turquoise blue, those were the border states that were still a part of the South, but they fought against the South because these states were allowed to keep their slaves. Here we got a battle. Uh, the Union on the right, Confederacy on the left. And here you have a political cartoon of Abraham Lincoln giving emancipation to slavery and that'll do donkey that'll do so <clears throat> i know that was a lot i talked a lot it was really long but this was a big big section of notes so yeah sorry so much talking i know it was like 12 or 13 slides of writing a lot of stuff a lot of stuff so yeah, you know, I'm sorry, but important things happen because those things are going to set up the things we're about to talk about in the next lecture, which is going to be the things that's going to set up the next lecture. It all sets each other up. I hope you're seeing the the correlation. Anyways, hopefully you guys 
did enjoy. Uh, your homework is page 195, two through four. 195, two through four. All right. If you guys did enjoy that, make sure you hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.